Hi there. So, I just finished recording um, The Seven Sermons of the Dead from Carl Jung's Red Book. And in the first sermon of the dead, Jung introduces us to this word, pleroma. And the pleroma is a symbol for the unification of opposites, for objective reality, for for that which exists when no one is watching. Um, the pleroma is infinity and it is nothingness because it has all qualities and no qualities and etc etc and um, Jung's words are very religious and rather sexist and pretty difficult to understand and but I think that this idea of the pleroma is really a very very important one I think about it every day and so I want to try to explain to you what the Pleroma is. But before I try to put my own words in a video, because that's hard work, I'm doing a bunch of studying, reading. So there's this essay here, The World of Mental Process by Gregory Bateson in his book Angel's Fear, where he's trying to move towards an epistemology of the sacred, so a, a naturalistic definition of sacred, one that doesn't posit supernatural entities like Krishna. Um, and this essay is about Carl Jung's distinction, the pleroma, about this word pleroma and the distinction between creatura and pleroma, creation and pleroma, that's in the first sermon. Um, and I think Gregory Bateson has some really important insight into what this word means outside of a strictly, you know, if we're going to use it in everyday parlance, it can't just be tied to cosmology, it has to be a concept, it has to be a little bit more understandable. Red Book's not very understandable. It's pretty, but it's not very understandable. So. I'm going to read to you now this essay called The World of Mental Process, and then eventually I will make a video or a series of videos that describes what the pleroma is, what I think the pleroma is. Okay, so let's begin. The World of Mental Process. Before we proceed further, I want to elaborate on the contrast made by Carl Gustav Jung between creatura and pleroma. This will give us an alternative starting point for epistemology, one that will be much healthier, but one that will be a much healthier first step than the separation of mind and matter attributed to René Descartes. In place of the old Cartesian dualism, which proposed mind and matter as distinct substances, I want to talk about the nature of mental process, or thought, in the widest sense of that word, and the relationship between thought and the material world. I'm going to include within the category of mental process a number of phenomenon which most people do not think of as process of thought. For example, I shall achieve, include the process by which you and I achieve our autonomy, the injunctions, false starts, and self-corrections, obediences to circumstance, and so on, by which the differentiation and development of the embryo is achieved. Embryology is, for me, a mental process, and I shall also include the more mysterious processes by which it comes about that the formal relations of our anatomy are recognizable in the anthropoid, in the anthropoid ape, the horse, and the whale, what zoologists call homology, i.e. along with embryology I shall include evolution within the term mental process. Along with those two big ones, biological evolution and, embry and embryology, I include all those lesser exchanges of information and injunction that occur inside organisms and between organisms and that in aggregate we call life. In fact, Wherever information or comparison is of the essence of our explanation, there, for me, is mental process. Information can be defined as a difference that makes a difference. 
so this perhaps will give a little bit more insight on on that part in in the, the first sermon of the dead where Jung talks about how our essence is differentiation here Bateson is talking about that information is about difference that makes a difference that whenever we perceive what we're perceiving isn't the thing in its essence rather we're perceiving a difference between what was before or between this and that the only thing that we can perceive is a relationship is differences between things that's perception that's differentiation okay in fact wherever information or comparison is of the essence of our explanation there for me is mental process information can be defined as a difference that makes a difference a sensory end organ is a comparator, a device which responds to difference. Of course, the sensory end organ is material, but it is this responsiveness to difference that we shall use to distinguishing. It, but it is this responsiveness to difference that we shall use to distinguish its functioning as mental. Right. So the eye is a material organ, but its responsiveness to differences in light. That responsiveness is what we will call mental. Similarly, the ink on this page is material, but the ink is not my thought. Even, the most, uh, even at the most elementary level, the ink is not signal or message. The difference between paper and ink is the signal. All right, so I pick up that difference between paper and ink, and I translate that difference into another difference, the difference between sound and silence in my voice, which is then picked up by my microphone and translated into your speakers and on and on and on. Differences making more differences. It is, of course, true that our explanations, our textbooks dealing with non-living matter, are full of information. But this information is all ours. It is part of our life processes. The world of non-living matter, the pleroma, which is described by the laws of physics and chemistry, itself contains no description. A stone does not respond to information and does not use injunctions or information or trial and error in its internal organization. To respond in, be in a behavioral sense, the stone would have to use energy contained within itself as organisms do. It would cease to be a stone. The stone is affected by forces and impacts, but not by differences. So what he's saying about the pleroma or the difference between the pleroma and creatura is that pleroma is pure physical reality, right? So it contains all that is. The pleroma is all that is. There is nothing but physical reality. But within physical reality, there are differences. Right. The stone is different from the sea, is different from the air. And it is responses to those differences, or it is the relationships between all of those differences. That is what makes up mental world, creatura. Right. So the pleroma is, is what exists objectively, but there's no mind in it. I don't know if this makes any sense at all. I'm trying. I'm really trying hard. <laughs> it is, of course, true that our explanations, our textbooks dealing with non-living matter, are full of information, but this information is all ours. It is part of our life process. The world of non-living matter, the pleroma, which is described by the laws of physics and chemistry, itself contains no description, right? The description is ours, even though the book is made of the pleroma. The pleroma doesn't contain the description. The pleroma just contains a book with, with letters in it. The description is, is a, a mental thing. A stone does not respond to information and does not use injunctions or information or trial and error in its internal organization. To respond in a behavioral sense, the stone would have to use energy contained within itself, as organisms do. It would cease to be a stone. The stone is affected by forces and impacts, but not by differences. I can describe the stone. <coughs> I can describe the stone, but it can, I can describe the stone, but it can describe nothing. I can use the stone as a signal, perhaps as a landmark, but it is not the landmark. I can give the stone a name. I can distinguish it from other stones, 
but it is not its name, and it cannot distinguish. It uses and contains no information. It is not even an it, except insofar as I distinguish it from the remainder of inanimate matter. What happens to the stone, and what it does when nobody is around, is not part of the mental process of any living thing. For that, it must somehow make and receive news. You must understand that while Pleroma you must understand that while Pleroma is without thought or information, it still contains and is the matrix of many other sorts of regularities. Inertia, cause and effect, connection and disconnection, and so on and so on. These regularities are, for lack of a better word, imminent in the Pleroma. Although they can be translated, again, for lack of a better word, Although, for lack of a better word, they can be translated into the language of Kritura, where alone language can exist, the material world remains inaccessible. The Kantian ding on sitch, which you cannot get close to. We can speculate, and we have speculated very carefully and very creatively about it, but in the end, in the last analysis, everything we say about the Pleroma is a matter of speculation, and as such, Mystics, as William Blake, for example, frankly deny its existence. So that's why Jung says, it is fruitless to think about the pleroma. To do so implies your own dissolution. We are embedded in creatura. You cannot escape your own subjectivity. So we can theorize and say that the pleroma exists, this objective world without, without any mental process, just full of things, except there would be no things, because there wouldn't be any differences between things, just this, this uniform manifold of matter, of being, right? We can, we can theorize that it exists, but in the end it's always going to be a theory. We can never access pure pleroma. We can only access it through these differences, through our relationship to the world, this cultural relationship. Am I making any sense at all? Please let me know. Let me know if, like, I'm just, like, making gibberish or if I'm making sense. Sometimes I don't know. That's the thing about all these mystical ideas. They, like, they make sense on one level, and on another level, they're just utter, utter nonsense. But maybe that's the point. <laughs> and as such, mystics such as William Blake, for example, frankly deny its existence. In summary, then, we will use Young's term pleroma as a name for that unliving world described by physics, which itself contains and makes no distinctions, though we must, of course, th though we must, of course, make distinctions in our own description of it. In contrast, we will use Kritura for the world of explanation in which the very phenomena to be described are among themselves governed and determined by difference, distinction, and information. Although there is an apparent dualism in this dichotomy between Kritura and Pleroma, it is important to be clear that these two are not in any way separate or separable except as levels of description. On the one hand, all of Kritura exists within and through Pleroma. The use of the cr term Kritura I itself affirms the presence of certain organizational and communicational characteristics which are themselves not material. On the other hand, knowledge of the Pleroma exists only in Kritura, we can meet only the, the two only in combination, never separately. That's important. We can meet the two only in combination, never separately. The laws of physics and chemistry are by no means irrelevant to the Kritura. They continue to apply, but they are not sufficient for explanation. Thus, Kritura and Pleroma are not, like Descartes' mind and matter, separate substances, for mental processes require arrangements of matter in which to occur. Areas where pleroma is characterized by organization, which permits it to be affected by information, as well as by physical events. We can move on from the notion of mental process to ask, what then is a mind? And if this is a useful notion, can one usually make use of the plural and speak of minds, which might engage in interactions which are in turn mental? The characterization of the notion of a mind was one of the central thrusts of mind and nature, Gregory Bateson's earlier book, where a series of criteria were laid out for the identification of minds. This definition anchors the notion of mind firmly to the arrangement of material parts. One, a mind is an aggregate of interacting parts or components. 
Two, the interaction between parts of mind is triggered by difference. Three, mental process requires collateral energy. Four, mental process requires circular or more complex chains of determination. Five, in mental process, the effects of differences are to be regarded as transforms, i.e. coded versions of events which preceded them. Six, the description and classification of these processes of transformation disclose a hierarchy of logical types imminent in the phenomena. Wow, that's, uh, I'm not really sure what to say about that. This is a long essay. I'm going to be reading for a while. Let's read those criteria again, see if we can make any sense of them. I don't really know if I have anything to say about them, but they're important, so I'm going to read them again. One, a mind is an aggregate of interacting parts or components. Two, the interaction between parts of mind is triggered by difference. Three, mental processes require collateral energy. Four, mental processes require circular or more complex chains of determination. Five. In mental process, the effects of difference are to be regarded as transforms, i.e. coded versions of events which preceded them. Six, the description and classification of these processes of transformation disclose a hierarchy of logical types imminent in the phenomena. If you consider these criteria, you will recognize that they fit a number of complex entities that we are used to talking about and investigating scientifically, such as animals and persons, and in fact, all organisms. There's the deep continuity of mind and life, right? These criteria for mind are not isolated simply to, to uh, humans with symbol brains. They also work well for bacteria. If you consider these criteria, you will recognize that they fit a number of complex entities that, are, that we are used to talking about and investigating scientifically, such as animals and persons, and in fact, all organisms. They also apply to parts of an organism organisms that have a degree of autonomy in their self-regulation and functioning individual cells, for instance, and organs. Then, you can go on to notice that there is no requirement of a clear boundary, like a surrounding envelope of a skin or membrane, and you can recognize that this definition includes only some of the characteristics of what we call life. That's very interesting. So the definition of organism and the definition of mind are related, but they're separate, and you can have mental processes that transcend the boundaries of organism. It's really important. Then you can go on to notice that there is no requirement of a clear boundary, like a surrounding envelope or skin or membrane. And you can recognize that this definition includes only some of the characteristics of what we call life. As a result, it applies to a much wider range of these complex phenomena called systems, including systems consisting of multiple organisms, or systems in which some of the parts are living and some are not, or even to systems in which there are no living parts. What is described here is a something that can receive information and can, through the self-regulation or self-correction made possible by circular chains of causation, maintain the truth of sim sim certain propositions about itself. These two provide the rudiments of identity. Unlike the stone, the mind we are describing is an it. There is, however, no reason to assume that it will be either conscious or capable of self-replication, like some of the minds we count among our friends and relatives. A given mind is likely to be a component or subsystem in some larger and more complex mind, as an individual cell may be a component in an organism, or a person may be a component in a community. The world of mental processes opens it into a self-organizing world of Chinese boxes in which information generates further information. This is a book, above all, concerned with certain characteristics of the interface between Pleroma and Critura, and also with interfaces between different kinds of mental subsystems, including relations between persons and between human communities and ecosystems. We will be especially concerned with the way in which our understanding of such interfaces underlies epistemology and religion, bearing in mind that because what is, identi what 
bearing we will be especially concerned with the way in which our understanding of such interfaces underlies epistemology and religion, bearing in mind that because what is is identical for all human purposes with what can be known, there can be no clear line between epistemology and ontology. Right, so epistemology would be creatura, whereas ontology would be pleroma, but there can be no clear line between them. Interesting. Very interesting. When we distinguish between creatura from pleroma by some first primary act of distinguishing, we are founding the science of epistemology, rules of thought. And our epistemology is a good epistemology insofar as the regularities of the pleroma can be regularly, appropriately translated in our thought and insofar as our understanding of creatura, namely of all embryology, biological evolution, ecology, thought, love, hate, and human organization, all of which require different kinds of description than those we use in describing the inanimate material world can grow and sit on top of, and can com be comfortably deductive from, that primary step in epistemology. I think that Descartes' first epistemological step, the separation of mind from matter and the cogito, established bad premises, perhaps ultimately lethal premises for epistemology, and I believe that Jung's statement of the connection between pleroma and creatura is a much healthier first step. Jung's epistemology starts from comparison of difference, not from matter. So, I will define epistemology as the science that studies the process of knowing, the interaction of the capacity to respond to differences on the one hand with the material world in which those differences somehow originate on the other. We are concerned then with an interface between pleroma and creatura. There is a more conventional definition of epistemology, which simply says that epistemology is the philosophic study of how knowledge is possible. I prefer my definition, how knowing is done, because it frames creatura within the larger total, the presumably lifeless realm of pleroma, and because my definition bluntly identifies epistemology as the study of phenomena at an interface and as a branch of natural history. Let me begin this study by mentioning the basic characteristic of the interface between Creatura and Pleroma, which will perhaps help to define the direction of my thinking. I mean the universal circumstance that the interface between Pleroma and Creatura is an example of a contrast between a map and a territory, is, I suppose, the primary and fun most fundamental example. So the territory is the Pleroma, but the map, the representation of the territory, is the Creatura. Of course, the map is also part of the territory, because the map is physical, it's made of matter, which is the pleroma, so you get this, this uh, Ouroboros thing going on, where the thing is inside itself, that's critical there. Um, let's go back. Let me begin this study by mentioning a basic characteristic of the interface between pleroma and creatura, which will perhaps help to define the direction of my thinking. I mean the universal circumstance that the interface between the pleroma and Keturah is an example of a contrast between map and territory is, I suppose, the primary and most fundamental example. This is the old contrast which Alfred Kor Koryabuski long ago called attention and remains basic for all healthy epistemologies and basic to epistemology. Capital. Every human individual, every organism, has his or her own personal habits of how she, he or she builds knowledge, and every cultural, religious, or scientific system promotes a particular epistemological habit. These individual or local systems are indicated here with a small e. Warren McCulloch used to say that the man who claimed to have direct knowledge, i.e. no epistemology, actually had a bad one. All right, so this is, this is the problem with science, is that often, I mean, not, not serious scientists, but often the way that science is represented to the public, it's presented as if it is direct knowledge of reality, it is truth, right? And so here, Warren McCulloch is making this point that a man who claims to have direct knowledge, i.e. no epistemology, pure direct access to knowledge, doesn't actually have no epistemology, he actually just has a bad epistemology, <laughs> an epistemology that doesn't recognize the relationship between map and territory. Oh, hey, look. 
A ladybug just fell on me. Is that symbolic of something? Look at this ladybug. Hey. <laughs> I like hanging out on a screen with you. I hope that's okay. I hope this isn't weird. I'm like reading this essay and like providing strange comments and distractions about ladybugs, but I, this is a really important essay. It's like a pretty big deal. I think it, 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 it just, um, I feel like a lot of questions are being answered. I find reading it very satisfying. Um, so I'm really glad to be sharing this experience of reading this essay with you. So thanks for reading it with me. It is the tasks of anthropologists to achieve comparisons between the many diverse systems and perhaps to evaluate the price that muddled systems pay for their errors. Most local epistemologies, personal and cultural, continually err, alas, in confusing map with territory and in assuming that the rules for drawing maps are imminent in the nature of that which is being represented in the map. My nose is very itchy. Let's read that one more time. Most local epistemologies, personal and cultural, continually err, alas, in confusing map with territory and in assuming that all rules for drawing maps are imminent in the nature of that which is being represented in the map. All the following rules of accurate thought and communication apply to the properties of maps, that is, to mental processes, for in the Pleroma there are no maps, no names, no classes, and no members of classes. Right? There is no map in the Pleroma. The Pleroma just is. It can't be mapped. It, I mean, we can map it, but once we start to map it, we're, we're in the cultural realm. We're in this representational realm. So, all of the following rules of accurate thought and communication apply to the properties of maps, that is, to mental process. For in the Pleroma there are no maps, no names, no classes, and no members of classes. Okay, so here's... These are a bit like Zen koans, what's coming up next. I had to read them several times over. I'm still not sure I understand them, but they, uh, they're good. So let's, let's repeat them. The map is not the territory. The name is not the thing named. The name of the name is not the name. Got that one? The name of the name is not the name. So, what's a good example of that? What's the name of a name? It's like the name of the English language is English. I don't know. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm confused. Will you help me? <laughs> what, what does he mean by the name of the name is not the name? Well, let's see. There's a parenthetical. You remember the white Kate knight and Alice? Alice is rather tired of listening to songs, and offered yet another, she asks its name. The name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes, said the White Knight. That's the name of the song, is it? says Alice. No, you don't understand, says the White Knight. That's not the name of the song, that's what the name is called. <laughs> representation! What is representation? The name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. That's not the name of the song. That's simply what the name of the song is called. So you've got this song, right? And the song has a name. And the name is called Haddock's Eyes. But Haddock's Eyes is not the name of the song. That's simply what the name of the song is named. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I feel, I sense an infinite regress coming, but that's the point, right? That's this Ouroboros. Right? When you, when you have this violation of logical types, you're going to infinitely regress into yourself. That's the point. Um, okay, a few more colons. The item in the class is not the class, even when the class has only one item. Right? So, the class of life-bearing planets is Earth, but Earth is not the class of life-bearing planets. Earth is just Earth. The item in the class is not the class. I feel like there's like, God, I wish I knew more formal group theory. I feel like group theory has a lot to say about this. I don't know any group theory. Does anybody know any group theory? You can like teach me all the group theory that I need to understand this stuff. 
the item in the class is not the class, even when the class is only one item. The class is not a member of itself, right? That would be this Ouroboros problem again. The class is a class. The class has members, sub-things, but the class is not a member of itself. Some classes have no members. If, for example, I say, I never read the small print, there's no class of events consisting of my reading the small print. In the Creatura, all its names, maps, and names of relations... Oh, in the Creatura, all is names, maps, and names of relations, but still the name of the name is not the name. The name of the relation is not the relation, even when the relation between A and B is of the kind we denote by saying that A is the name of B. Oh dear. Oh dear. So, in the Creatura, all is names, maps, and names of relations. Note, no matter, right? The Creatura is not material. It is embedded in matter. It is matter, but but what we're talking about is relationships between things, not the things themselves. In the Critura, all is names, maps, and names of relations. But still, don't mistake logical types, because the name of the name is not the name, and the name of the relation is not the relation, even when the relation between A and B is of the kind we denote by saying that A is the name of B. These constraints are eternal. They are necessarily true. And to recognize them gives something resembling freedom. Or shall we say that it is a necessary condition of skill? It will be interesting to compare them with other basic components of epistemology, such as St. Augustine's eternal verities or Jung's archetypes, and see where these fall in relation to the interface. Now, St. Augustine was not only a theologian, he was also a mathematician. He lived in Hippo in North Africa and was probably more Semite than Indo-European, which means the pre in the present context that he may very well have been quite at home in algebraic thought. It was, I gather, the Arabs who introduced the concept of any into mathematics, thus creating algebra, for which we still use an Arabic word, algebra. These verities were rather simple propositions, which here I quote Warren McCulloch, McCulloch to whom I owe much. Listen to the thunder of that saint in almost 500 AD. Seven and three are ten. Seven and three have always been ten. Seven and three at no time and in no way have ever been anything but ten. Seven and three will always be ten. I say that these indestructible truths of the arithmetic are common to all who reason. St. Augustine's eternal verities were crudely or bluntly stated, but I think the saint would go along with the more modern versions, e.g. that the equation x plus y equals z is soluble, uniquely soluble. There is only one solution for all values of x and y, provided that we agree on the steps and tricks which we must use. If quantities are appropriately defined, and if addition is appropriately defined, then x plus y equals z is uniquely soluble, and z will be one substance, and c will be of one substance with x and y. <laughs> Theological language there. Body and blood are of one substance with Christ and z will be of one substance with x and y. But oh my, what a long step it is from the blunt statement 7 plus 3 equals 10 to our cautious generalization hedged with definitions and conditions. We have, in a certain sense, pulled the whole of arithmetic over the line that was to divide Creatura from Pleroma. That is, the statement no longer has the flavor of naked truth, and it is instead clearly an artifact of human thought. In, indeed, the thought of a particular human, of particular humans at particular times and places. So he's saying, a little metaphorically, that the statement 3 plus 7 equals 10 feels more like the pleroma, right? You're talking about things. Whereas when you abstract it and talk about Algebra. Oh no, I'm getting a phone call. Oh no, I'm gonna have to put this video in two types because I have to pick up this phone call. Okay, okay. Goodbye.